members of the teaching faculty, members of the graduating faculty. This is uh, for the students in whose honor we are gathered today, an occasion, of course, of celebration and the beginning of a new life. For you, this is the first important milestone of your life. You've completed many years of schooling, more than you will ever have again. And you stand on the at the threshold of university and more specialized education, from which you will then go forward into productive, professional lives. But it is also the end of something. Uh, and it's one of these occasions in which ends and beginnings merge into each other in a complicated, sometimes painful, but always exciting and challenging way. In a few years, you will be sitting in the audience and watching your children graduate, and you will be feeling the same financial burden, your pockets depleted, your uh, your bank accounts badly in need of rehabilitation as you sit there watching these kids go away into a different and hopefully more independent life. Your childhood is being left behind. Everything that has so far made you is what you have gone through at this school, which is a remarkable institution in the middle of the middle of the world, in a way, place where you have stood at the boundaries of East and West. You have lived in an, era, in an era of volatile and complex and sometimes bloody events. There has been unsettlement around you during your years at Vermont High School. And you face the future with this behind you. Now, one of the great lessons, it seems to me, that you must have learned here and you must have heard from your teachers and obviously from your parents, is that you make your way. You create yourself, your history, and your life. And now, as you graduate, you are more than ever responsible for those. There is no magic road. Nobody's ever going to tell you, certainly not in university. Nobody's ever going to tell you what you should do. There's not going to be a pattern laid before you, which you must follow. You have to discover that for yourself in your choice of profession, in your choice of career, and of course in your choice of partner for the rest of your life. One of the things that this whole occasion, this ceremony, signifies is that you are now being opened out onto the world. And I think one of the things that you should retain of this day of this commemoration is openness to the world, not just to the people you know, but to the world all around you, to the world that is distant from this, to other cultures, other languages, other people, other traditions, other religions. I think if you think of your life going forth from here as a great human adventure, I think then you will have justified and fulfill the promise made to you by the school and by your parents that education is the opening of the door and the opening of the way. There are three things that I want to very briefly mention to you as something that can happen in this way and think about and do it. The first
those kinds of things. And as you go forward, you will see the profession and so forth. But I would say that that, that that is your social self. There's another self <coughs> which I want to emphasize, which is your inner self, your hidden self, your personal identity, which isn't just a matter of who you were, where you were born, who your parents were, or what school you went to, but something that exists within you, your sensibility, your memories, your talents, your gifts of various sorts. And so the first point I want to make then is that it seems to be terribly important that as you grow in life, you should try to develop and discover your inner self. To what end? To in the end of becoming more free. I think all of us live within restrictions. We have to be in a society that happily rules. Although I must say, loving these capitalists are truly determined to relax. But even so, there are certain things you have to do. But the inner self, you can do a great deal more. It can discover the past, it can discover well and the good one, it can investigate the world of science, the world of art, the culture, and there's a certain kind of wonderful liberty, which it seems to me it's your duty as a human being to develop. So I would say then the first great lesson is self-discovery, the discovery of the inner self, and the development of the inner self tending towards Freedom. The second thing that seems to be terribly important at this milestone event is your attitude towards authority. Uh, there's always authority in there. There's always somebody above you. There's always somebody who knows more than you do. And in school, you've been the students of dedicated and gifted teachers who know more than you do. And in time, probably you will occupy the limits of authority. The question is, what have you done with it? How do you look at it? How do you, uh, how do you relate to it? And one of the things that seems to be terribly important in an age in which people continually lose their freedom to authority is to develop an attitude of skepticism and question. It's much better, I think to look at authority and to say, why did you say that? Some public figure, some politician perhaps, some superior officer if you're in the army, a, uh, a, uh, a learned person, and say to yourself or to this person, say, why do you say that? To ask questions, not to accept what is given as routine or as the topic answer, but to take from that a questioning attitude to try to discover more than what is given, rather than less, or to accept and less. So I think, uh, I think authority needs, especially in this, in this age of conformity, and your generation, and I think it's special generation, is emerging from a kind of, uh, a kind of, uh, of ambiguity and complexity, and you have to find your way. But there is no better way to look and see and discover than to ask questions. To be permanently rested intellectually, not to sit and uh, remain the same. One of my favorite stories, in fact it is my favorite story, I must tell you, which strikes me as the perfect attitude towards authority, concerns three scientists working in a lab. One of them is a British scientist, no offense to the British ambassador, Another is a German scientist, and a third is, let's say, a graduate of Romana High School, who's a scientist. There's a tremendous explosion, and a great deal of radiation is released. Shortly after the explosion, the three scientists are discovered to be alive, shaken, not in very good condition. The doctor comes to see them, examines them, and tells each of them that they have a month to live. One month, and then there will be no more. So the doctor asks the German scientist, he says to him, what do you plan to do with the month that you have left? And the German scientist said, well, I'll, I'll go to Munich and I'll drink beer and enjoy myself to the end of my day. He turns then to the British scientist and he says to him, what are you going to do with the month that you have left? And the British scientist says, 
but I'm going to continue working until my dying day in the in, to sort of honor my country and my queen. He then turns to the graduate of the Manhattan High School and tells the professor, and asks him, what are you going to do with the Manhattan High School? And the graduate of the Manhattan High School says, I'm going to see another doctor. <laughs> 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 And that is to take seriously, to take seriously, that's not at this very moment, that's soon, to take seriously the idea of citizenship, one of the great problems of the Arab world. And I, I grew up in the Arab world, although I've lived most of my life abroad. But one of the things that always struck me was the sense that somebody out there was doing things, and that I, or we, as the individual agents, had very little power to do anything. It wasn't our problem. They did it. The government did it. The, the Americans did it. The Zionists did it. Whatever. And there, it seems to me, there's always a sense in, of sort of thinking that responsibility lies elsewhere. It seems to me that one of the things we need to develop in this part of the world, and as, um, uh, as Sammy Kotas said, we, we must look around and see what we have done to nature. We have done it, not somebody else. This is our nature and we have mutilated and are destroying it. This is our country, our heritage, and look what we've done. I think to assume the responsibilities of citizenship is to assume not just the mechanical process of going to the, to the, to the polls to vote and so on, but also feeling oneself a participant in the social life and the countries in which you live whether you are Lebanese, or as so many of you are not, uh, uh, whatever citizenship you are. Citizenship means belonging, and belonging and feeling responsible for participating in directly as if it was yours. It is yours. And with that goes a sense of tolerance, a sense of must go, a sense of tolerance, and a sense of letting things be, people be, coexisting, not with violence, uh, and uh, impatient, but rather with a kind of reasoned attitude, reflective attitude, in which you go your way and your fellow citizen goes his or her way, and together you create a harmonious, or try to create a harmonious society in which uh, all can live and prosper. Those are very difficult things to, to do, and certainly very difficult things to achieve in one's life, but I think they are of tremendous importance to you and to us all because you are the generation going forward now and our hopes are in you and what you do will make a difference for your children. Good luck to you and congratulations.